So the transits that are still interesting to us here in 2019 are the ones that are taking place in other solar systems. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Yes. That implies something, right? Yes, it does. That implies that there are actually planets around other stars. And in fact, the very way we discovered planets around other stars had to do with the way that the planets were orbiting around those parent stars. Right. And so there's a whole new class of planets that we know a lot about now yes. that are called extrasolar planets. Extrasolar planets. Extrasolar. Extrasolar means they're not orbiting our sun. They're orbiting another star. All right. We now know of over 4,000 extrasolar planets. Wait a minute. 4,000. Over 4,000. And oh, by the way, 4, that 000. number keeps going up, so it's a little bit hard for me to keep track. I think the, <laughs> I think the latest number I saw was 4,084 known confirmed exoplanets or extrasolar planets. Incredible. And so, so by the way, let me just let me throw that shortening in. Yes. You'll, you'll see the word exoplanet. Right. And exoplanet is just because guys like myself got tired of saying extrasolar planet. It was just too many syllables. Yeah. So we just cut it down to exoplanet. Shorten it up. Make it quick. And we're moving go. on. Okay, I got it. In with a cool crowd. So if you're in with a cool crowd, you'll call them exoplanets. So when you hear the term exoplanet, just think about a planet around a star that's not the sun. It's around another one of those stars that we see up in the sky. First of now, all, that's just amazing that we have that technology. Right. And, and, and uh, yeah, it's sort of brilliant scientific thinking to figure this out, well, I think. And that's, and that's what I'd like to address a little bit. How did we find these things? right yeah there's there's two ways that we found exoplanets and actually the first way is a little bit more complicated it's a pretty pretty specialized circumstance okay that's when a very big massive planet is orbiting a fairly small star at a fairly close range right when that's happening scientists can actually detect the star moving in and out relative to the earth but really what it's doing it's kind of going around in a circle now, we don't see that other planet, but we can see the star moving in a circle. Well, that implies that there has to be another planet out there tugging it and making it move. Okay. The planet does not give off light, so it's not bright oh, enough for right. us to see. Yes, I remember you saying, hey, right. it's all about light. Right. That's Astronomy is prejudiced to things that glow in the dark, so that's why we have to watch <laughs> those things that glow in the dark, right? So, so the star itself, though, is glowing nicely, and we can see that star moving around in its own little circle because of a common orbit with a with a very heavy planet. But to us, what we're measuring is we're measuring the radial movement in and out. And we do that with this thing called Doppler shifts or red shift, blue shift. And and so that's the that's the wavelengths of light being shifted relative to be, because of the motion of that star. So so one one of the ways we can figure out that there are planets around other stars is we can just see that planet, that star rather, we can see that star, that parent star vibrating in and out a little bit which really means it's going around in tiny circles. Got okay. It. Yeah. But okay, there are only cool. a very special few um, star planet combinations that are just right for us to detect that kind of radial motion. Well, and it's at such a distance too. And exactly. It's, it's still a uh, mind boggling. And for me, anyway, that we can take those tiny little shifts and things and then extrapolate that that's an orbit. That's right. Uh, that's right. Exactly. Cool idea. But so, so, Astronomers came up with then a second way to potentially identify planets that are orbiting other stars. Okay. And this still is kind of a Goldilocks situation where everything has to be lined up just right. Got it. It's just that it's a more common occurrence, which is right. something called a transiting exoplanet. So we've talked about transits. Okay. Transits in our own solar system are a planet moving in, the, in front of the face of a sun. Well, a transiting exoplanet is another solar system out in our galaxy where the planet's planes of orbit are lined up just right to where the planet will pass in front of the face of its parent star. Okay. And it, when it does that, it dims the light from that parent star down a little bit. Okay. And then as it moves off the surface, off the face of the of its parent star, the light comes back up again. So so it's just passing between us. It's not actually touching the star, but right. it's passing in between us and that star. It drops the light coming to Earth down a little bit as it moves in front, and then as it moves out of the way, the light comes back up again. So, right. so scientists d developed a whole series of cameras that were very sensitive to picking up these slight variations in the light coming from stars due to planets passing in front of them. Wow. And they mounted some of those cameras on a couple of spacecraft. The, okay. first, the first spacecraft to go into orbit around the Earth um, that had this technology on it was called Kepler. Wow. And so Kepler, Kepler was a, a, a telescope 
named after Johannes Kepler, who studied planetary motions, by the way. So, so Kepler was a telescope that was specifically designed to watch thousands and thousands of stars, photograph them over and over and over, compare those images then from night to night and see if this dimming of light was taking place. Okay. When Kepler then identified stars that were dimming, they would go back and do follow-up observations of those specific stars to see if they could more carefully measure the dimming of that starlight. Okay. And with that technology, Kepler was able to identify literally thousands of candidates for planets orbiting other stars. So then that, that information is given to the astronomy community on the surface of the Earth. Those astronomers then begin to watch those star systems, and then they right. can identify those planets very carefully and figure out the characteristics. How big is the planet? How, how long does it take to move in front of the star? Therefore, how far away from its parent star is it? All those kinds of things. Well, they give you that information so that, that you said follow-up, so everyone can start to follow up. And exactly. Then, then, then see what the distances are and see if there are other planets there, but yeah. not just the one you see. That So this Kepler... Um, telescope sounds um, like an amazing piece of equipment. It, and, it, and it was. So, so the Kepler telescope s spent several years in, in service, and it is now, uh, it is now defunct. Okay. <laughs> it's, All right. its cameras quit working. But, but in the process, though, Kepler, we, we went from knowing about a, a dozen or so exoplanets to literally knowing about thousands of right. exoplanets, all because of the data coming from the Kepler Space Telescope. But if you can imagine the process I just described, it kind of had a, a prejudice, a selection mm -hmm. effect is what we call it in oh, science. Okay. Its selection effect was it tended to find big planets around other stars. And that's because it was looking for stars that were dimming down. Well, obviously, the bigger the planet is, the more the starlight will dim down as the planet moves in front of the face of the sun or of that uh, face uh, of the that, other star. Right. So so Kepler's, Kepler's exoplanets that I, it identified were pre-selected to be big ones. Yes. So so those planets wouldn't be capable of supporting what we would call life as we know it, right? Yes. Think of them as like mega Jupiters. Right. Right. So right. so Jupiter's already impossible for us to live on. It's a gas giant. Gravity is way too strong, all that stuff. Right. Okay. So so think about something that's, you know, ten to a hundred times the size of Jupiter. So it's not going to be life on something like yeah, that, it, generally it, speaking. It, it's it not it's not a perfect situation for what we know as life here on Earth, which is uh, something that is uh, carbon-based, something that lives with you know, liquid water and lives on liquid water and things like that. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking for the kind of life that we understand, sure. it's better for us to look for planets that are about the same size and about the same distance away from their parent star as the Earth is. Or in other words, they're about the right distance from their parent star where liquid water could potentially exist on the surface. That sounds like a very difficult thing to, uh, to measure. You're, you're really uh, trying to look at that parent star for that planet and measure the distance in the Goldilocks zone yeah, that you were right. talking about. Um, I just don't understand the math that get behind <laughs> that, so well, I won't I, even try. <laughs> but I can, give you a, I can give you a quick preview, which is this. One of the reasons that that telescope got named Kepler is because Johannes Kepler back in the 1600s, actually did something very brilliant. He figured out that the period of time it takes for a planet to go around the sun is related to how far away it is. Now, that, that doesn't sound that amazing. It's like, okay, well, the, lo the farther it is away, the longer it takes to go around. I get it. But no, it, with, with Kepler's law, this is Kepler's okay. third law, it related it exactly in a mathematical way. So if you could figure out the period of the orbit, you could actually figure out exactly how far away it was from the parent star. Okay. And so so we can we can apply Kepler's third law, which he applied to our own planets in our own solar system. We can apply that to these exoplanets. So if we see the same planet move in front of that star a couple of times, we know the period of its orbit. And if we know the period of its orbit and the mass of the parent star, which we have other ways to figure that out. Right, right then we can figure out exactly how far away it is. Oh, okay. If we can figure out that how far like... away it is, then we can figure out whether or not it's in the Goldilocks zone. Right. That because just we know not ours. too hot, not <laughs> too cold, just right <laughs> for water to exist on the surface, right? Right. So, so all right. So, so, so you got, let me just say, let, uh, see if I'm following this. You got Kepler out there, mm -hmm. this great telescope. He's 
this telescope is finding these giant planets passing in front of these smaller suns That's right. of theirs. And now the next step is to look at a planet that has is uh, maybe connected because if mm-hmm. our solar system has not eight planets, okay. But, uh, anyway, <laughs> that the uh, that the generally the idea is there are going to be other planets with it too. And yeah. it's certainly if that planet you can uh, find is going to be within that Goldilocks zone, mm-hmm. then we're golden, and we've got a planet that may support life. Right. So wow. so in order to find those Earth-like planets that are just that right distance away from big bigger stars, being all more like the Earth situation. We needed a telescope that had just a lot better resolution than Kepler had. Right. And so that's what really was required. So NASA then developed a brand new spacecraft okay. called TESS. All right. And TESS is a spacecraft that is the, – the, the, TESS is an acronym. It's, okay. It stands for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Okay, so they went right at it. What, they went they right were trying at it. To yes. get the information they needed and named it uh, the same. Exactly. Right, so it. so with, with TESS, or the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, NASA developed a spacecraft that was better suited for high-resolution imaging of very right. minute variations in star brightness to find these Earth-like planets around stars capable of supporting life. Right. And so now that TESS has come online... The expectation, this is, TESS has only been up there for a very short time, by the way. Right. So, so TESS is actually expected to identify maybe as many as 20,000 new exoplanets. And among that group of 20,000 new exoplanets, a, a, a substantially large number, yet unknown, but substantially large number of Earth-sized planets, Earths or super-Earths. Which means something something that's Earth sized or a little bit bigger, not not the size of Jupiter, but just a right. little bit bigger. So so when TESS begins to return data, which it already has, mm-hmm. and when we get that full catalog of TESS identified exoplanets, right. we're going to have a lot better idea of what planets are out there capable of supporting life because they're in their Goldilocks zone of their own parent star, and they're closer to the gravitational conditions of the of our own Earth. <laughs> 